boys screws loose they don't strip the bolts on them should have never sent them to pick up the work for them spray the park and had my shit inside the car marking smart boy was shooting with a 36 on him said if he wasn't in a rush they was all gone that curse of on all right greetings chuddlings welcome to another episode of chuddy's corner it is Sunday, November 26th. It's just a little bit before 9 p.m. And the Celtics are back. Uh, <laughs> 113-103 win over the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, we're going to get into all the gameplay. Uh, Jason Tatum, the high scorer on the night, 34 points. Before we get into that, I am your host, Doug Outs. You can follow me at Twitter at, at Doug underscore Outs. With me, as always, is Chuddy, King Chuddy. How you feeling tonight? Feeling good, solid win. Uh, wasn't the prettiest, but I will definitely take it. It's allowing me to enjoy my Sunday night. What about you? Ah, uh, doing about the same. And if you want to follow Chuddy, it's at King Chuddy. You can follow the page at Chuddy's Corner. And as always, a special shout out. I uh, will get this in early so I don't forget to our our sponsor, <laughs> NickPereno.com. Nick Pereno Real Estate. All your real estate needs. He's got you covered. Uh, we'll get right into it. Like I said, a 113-103 win. It definitely felt uh, like it was slipping away at some points. It felt like it was a lot closer. Uh, definitely was not, um, I don't know, I, w- I don't want to say not enjoyable, but not a very comforting game for a while. Even in the final minute or so, it just felt like anything was about to happen. But at the end of the day, looking at it uh, from a more bird's eye view, I think it was a pretty good win for the team. Chuddy, what would you see in this game? What would you like? Yeah, I agree with you. Overall, solid win, mostly positive takeaways. Definitely felt like Atlanta was just wouldn't die down the end. Uh, kept kept in it a lot longer than probably seemed like they could have. Credit to them. They were on the second night of a back-to-back, playing in Boston, got down almost 20 points. Easily could have quit, and they fought all, hard all the way to the end and made it more of a game than it looked like it was going to be. But overall, good win for the Celtics, playing obviously without Drew Holiday, without Chris Stapps, Porzingis back home in our own building came out looking great uh the offense was right back on track in the first half but really it was the defense that came through all game and really did a great job other than the hawks hitting some threes um trey young kind of abusing that drop coverage until joe finally decided to switch out with six minutes left in the game yeah oh yeah bogdan bogdanovich was uh just not missing shots it felt like uh shades of some of the playoff games last year where again it just felt like they would go on these little mini runs uh they went on a big 13-0 spurt in the third quarter with Trey Young on the bench that got them right back in the game like I said the Hawks easily could have rolled over and quit a lot of the uh what let them back in the game is the Celtics still a lot to clean up on the offensive end um like I said really good offense in the first half to I think they had 69 at the break and we're kind of running up and down the floor they were back to that pace back to that ball movement the Hawks came out running a ton of zone trying to hide Trey Young uh the Celtics did a great job staying disciplined moving the ball they were kind of picking the zone apart with their passing and then the Hawks tried to go back to man and then it was a lot of targeting Trey Young and a lot of uh beating them that way too so we were kind of doing it all then again I think it was a really good first half um did a great job defensively to control the things we need to control a uh, little slow start gave up eight offensive rebounds in the first half which is more than we'd like to see capella had half of them but i believe they only finished with 11 and capella got no more so they showed some attention there cleaned that up um and i mean other than a few spurts where they did let the hawks get into a rhythm like i said a lot too, more open threes than i'd like to see us give up but you kind of got to take away something and it seemed like they were committed to not letting them get going in the paint they were kind of living with the results of that drop coverage that very deep drop which was resulting in a lot of open looks trey had it going finally adjusted in time and i mean again like i said they held the hawks to 103 points for the entire game um even with our very lackadaisical offense in the second half only scoring 40 44 points i believe in the second half which is Still just way too little for the Celtics team to score. They got way too complacent at times, kind of turned it back on when they needed to, which is good to see. But again, let let a big lead get down, I think, all the way to six or four at one point, uh, which, again, is a little close for comfort. But like we said, the Hawks are a good team. They're the second best offense in the league coming in. We held them to their fewest points they've scored in a game the entire season by six points. 103 against that team is very impressive, again, especially without Holiday and Porzingis, who are two crucial parts of our defense. It was uh, great to see Nemes Kita get 
some real mm-hmm. minutes. And after kind of a slow, a shaky start on the first few possessions where it seemed like he was kind of lost when he got the ball down low. And I was like, oh, no, is he even going to be playable? He settled in. He was an absolute beast on the boards, uh, which is oh, what yeah. we need to see. Ten rebounds, six offensive rebounds. And again, it was just hustle. Uh, he provides a, a much kind of different type of big man than the other guys we play. Uh, you know, nothing against Luke, Chris Epps, and Al, who had an amazing game in his own right, but Keita brings that hustle and just like that in- intensity and athleticism on the glass that isn't there when he's not in there. Um, he looked a little bit lost trying to play that deep drop against Trey. Trey was either just pulling up for threes or taking it right in for the floater, but he did was able to adjust in his last few minutes. I thought he was just really working hard, forced a couple turnovers, so that was great to see. We obviously had Delano Banton starting. More of what you'd expect from him. Really good hustle minutes. Uh, nothing too crazy, but was crashing the boards. Team effort. We knew the rebounding was going to be a big deal uh, against this team, and I thought we did, for the most part, did a really good job. Led by Al Horford, 15 rebounds. Kind of a throwback game for him. He had a few nice blocks, too. And then, obviously, I think Tatum finished with nine rebounds. Brown had seven. Um, I already mentioned Keto with 10, too. So, did a really good job on the glass. Did a really good job of not letting Atlanta push the ball, play at their pace, get out and run. Um, and I felt even when Atlanta was scoring, you know, we were making them work for it in the half court they hit a lot of shots the threes were falling early you already mentioned for Trey and Bogdan so that's kind of what kept them in the game but like I said other than kind of a few spurts and um you know can't can't get so complacent on offense in the second half that's how you let leads slip away but overall we're able to close it out led as you said by Jason Tatum who had it going for most of the night um covering up for a lot of what was missing on offense and hitting some big shots down the stretch, had some key baskets, and they were able to close it out. A solid 10-point win against a good team. 7-0 and home now, uh, us in Denver, the only two teams that are undefeated at home, so good to get back in the win column. And like you said, it, it didn't feel maybe as good as it is now when you take a step back and, and look at all the things that we did well uh, pretty shorthanded. Yeah, uh, I think uh, a couple of things I want to touch on that you mentioned there. I think that uh, Nemeus Keita, uh, that was just a great, great way to say him, see him come out. I think uh, I agree with you when he first came out. There was a few points where he had the ball and it just looked like very concerning <laughs> if he was even going to be able to like handle having the ball near him. Um, but uh, he, he settled in, I think, a little, probably just a little bit of stage fright getting out there. Uh, he settled in great. Like you said, 10 rebounds. It just seemed I, I would have guessed that he had more, to be honest, but he only, did only play six th- offensive. Yeah, he did only play 15 minutes. So you got to think that that might change a little bit. I think that. Cornette's minutes could be, um, you know, taking a bite, uh, taking at least a back seat now with with the way that he played there, and especially these games. I think some of the games coming up, we have uh, going up against a bigger bigger lineup that's something we've struggled with. He mm-hmm. could hopefully be an answer for that. The thing that he's doing is he's grabbing the ball and he's coming down with it. He's not tipping the ball around. He's not smacking the ball around. I think the team as a whole uh, just was completely committed to rebounding, which is something yeah. that we haven't seen enough of. Um, you did mention, I think you might have – you might have switched the Jays up. It was Tatum that had nine and Brown had seven rebounds. But either way, oh, okay. just to get 16 out of those two is just huge for the team anyway. I just want to say it just because I know the intern might be on your ass for that. He um, has been lately. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I just, you know, I think when they can make that commitment to rebounding, it makes all the difference in the world. So I don't know if, you Definitely. know, it to do it without Porzingis out, not that he's a great rebounder. Um, know, but he – Still but he's just a big guy. Yeah. <laughs> to be able to do that just without him, I thought that that, was, that made all the difference in this game. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of the day, I think, too, Tatum turned it on a little bit in the fourth quarter. He just kind of came out a little hot in the fourth, sort of cooled down a little bit towards the end, but hit a few shots down the stretch that, that really mattered yep. and made all the difference. Um, it just seemed like there was just, aside from a really stretch in the third quarter, which we've just struggled with, with all year, um, mm-hmm. I actually saw – I have a stat here about our third quarter. So we're 29th in the NBA in third quarter offense, and we scored just 21 points tonight on 7 for 19 shooting with four turnovers. Tatum didn't score at all in the third quarter. Um, yeah. That's something that they're going to have to address because, uh, like I said, I think championship teams come out in the third quarter. We saw it with the Warriors a few years back where they just would bury teams in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and what it came down to, what I was seeing, was just a lot of – getting back into that thing where we're up by 20 points. And what do we start doing? We inbound the ball. We walk it up the floor. The mm-hmm. ball's crossing half court at like, you know, 16, 17 seconds. The first motion of the first motion in the offense, whether it's a screen or anything like that, or a pass is coming with maybe 12 seconds left in the shot clock. And then it just leads to bad offense. So I thought everything we did to gain that lead had to do with us get, pushing the ball. We were getting it across the half court line around 22 seconds, getting into the offense around 20 seconds. And then it just gives you so many more options. You move, The ball would move around so much more. And, and teams just can't cover that. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, we didn't have Drew or Porzingis now, but especially when those guys are out there, teams aren't going to be able to cover the ball moving around that much to guys who can score the way that we have. So um, yep. I really think that it just it just comes down to that. And, and that's one thing where I, I would like to see us – and I don't want to harp on the timeout thing. That's kind of like a little bit of a tired take, but I just do feel like there's sometimes where like the first sign of that, not even like, I'm not even worried about once there's like a huge run and they don't call a timeout. I feel like the first time that Joe sees them slow rolling the ball up the court, he should just call a timeout and just ask him what the fuck they're doing. Because it's so, it's <laughs> yeah. so noticeable now, the mm-hmm. difference that that makes in the offense. Uh, and I get it that it's hard to do that for 48 minutes a game. Um, you know, not, you know, for an entire game, for an entire game to be pushing the pace like that, but they have to do it. They can't, they can't take those long breaks. And I think the third quarter, that's what happens. They come out and they yeah. they build this lead, and then they just get into that kind of offense, and it's very frustrating. And it, I've pinpointed it. I've watched enough. We've watched seen enough this year. I've pinpointed. I've found it, and that's what it is. That's what it comes down to. It's you know, yeah. Well, and it goes back, I think, way before this year. We've been seeing it for five years. When the Celtics play with pace, they're better. And you hit the nail on the head where it's it's not so, it's not like sprinting up the floor and having fast breaks, but it's just getting into your offense quickly. You see, you know, it, it can be off a made basket. Just push the ball up the floor, start your action with 20 on the clock. It just allows you to have possessions with more passing. Like you said, when you're running your first action with 10 seconds left on the shot clock, you're basically getting one or two passes and someone's going to have to put up a shot, whether it's open or not. And that's what leads to bad offense leads to stagnance. Um, you see it happening a lot when Derek white comes off the floor. He was, uh, we didn't mention him yet. He had a great game um, doing a lot of stuff that doesn't show up in the box. Everything scores, but, but he, shooting from three. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he couldn't buy a three, but I mean, he had, ten six. Assi- he had 10 assists. He was plus 29 on the night. A guy on no drew. So obviously playing backups um, or point Tatum, which, you know, works, but Tatum, kind of naturally plays slowly he lets the game come to him wait for the double tries to start that stuff late which can be effective obviously and Tatum for the, had a very good game for the most part but it's it really just makes such a notable difference when the Celtics play with pace and are hurrying up and like I yeah. said we we easily we came out and I think part of it we you know which is a mistake that we've made a couple times probably thinking we've got the team the game's gonna roll over and quit the game's over and then it's just not. And like I said, that you doesn't saw it happen. That... It just doesn't happen in the NBA. <laughs> well, not in the a NBA. Twenty point and... lead doesn't mean anything in the NBA anymore. Exactly. But I think we had the chance. Like you said, if we had come out in that third quarter, it was a perfect opportunity. Like I said, the Hawks coming off a of back to back, down eighteen at halftime or something. We easily could have come out, kept our foot on the gas, played with pace, stretched the lead out to thirty, and then the game would have been over, and we could have rested yeah, on our morals for the rest of the game. Sixty nine fifty three at the half. So you're right. So yeah, sixteen point could've... lead. We could have come out on you know 15 to 5 run and the game would have basically been over i think the hawks probably would have been content to start resting guys at that point it went the other way we played super slowly and not only does that hurt our offense it finally let the hawks get into a rhythm with their offense and then when we're missing shots obviously allows them to get out in transition which is what the hawks want to do we highlighted how they play in pace they score a ton of points that's what they want to do when we're scoring obviously it's a lot harder for them to push yeah. the pace. Um, so the two things are obviously very clearly tied together. And that combo is exactly what led to the huge run for the Hawks. That's exactly how they got back into the game. And we've, we've seen it time and again, where we just slow down. And like you said, I don't know if it's us thinking that we have such a lead, we can't afford to slow it down and whittle the game away. But like you said, in the third quarter in today's NBA, unless you're up by 40 points, like that's just not the case. Yeah, so, uh, especially when you're a team that shoots the three. Like that team, they were saying on the broadcast that with Quinn Snyder, they've just completely committed to shooting a ton of mm-hmm. threes. And they had the guys, obviously, that can make those threes between uh, Bogdan, Bogdan, Bogdan Bogdanovich. Bogdan Bogdanovich. Bogdan. Yeah. Bog- Hell of a name. Um, um, but yeah, no, and it's it's like you said, and the and the way we were playing on defense, and I mean, God love Joe. He did it last year in the playoffs, too. Everyone was begging for us to get out of the drop coverage. I understand the personnel, like you don't want Keita or Cornette switching on to Trey Young, ideally, but at a certain point, you just, something's got to give, and they finally you don't did. This, this is what I don't get, and you're more of an X's and O's guy, so maybe you can explain this more to anyone who's wondering the same thing with this, with drop coverage. Like, I'm not saying that he has to get in, like, Trey Young's jock and then just get blown by him or whatever, like, or get mm-hmm. his, you know, ankle snapped and it's embarrassing, but, like, <laughs> I don't understand why it has to be, like, six feet. Like, can't you get, like, a little bit close? And can't you just kind of have, like, there's got to be other ways to run it. I, I, to me, I just don't understand drop coverage in the modern NBA against a team well, that can shoot like that. I just, maybe you can explain it more to people. Because so, to me, it makes no <laughs> sense. Yeah, and I mean, 
at this point in the NBA, like a massive part of defense is how you cover the pick and roll specifically. So, I mean, you can obviously basically switch everything, which is what the Celtics have done for a while. Um, not so much last year, but especially under Ime, kind of what they built up, what they did tonight when what Al was on the floor. I mean, that makes a huge difference. As you saw, Al was kind of able to do that. They switched switched to switching uh, for the last 640, I think, when Keita came out and the starters went back in and it changed yeah. everything because then – Young is kind of just forcing mismatches or what he thinks are mismatches against, you know, Hauser and Horford with the guys he was targeting. And that's fine. Like, I'll trust our guys in that. When you're playing such a deep drop, obviously the point is that, A, you want to keep the big guy, the rim protector, closer to the rim. You don't want him to get pulled out and have Trey Young blowing by him or it's a two-on-one. Um, You saw them with a couple alley-oops, you know, when we did that to the big guy. But, I mean, overall, it's, it's an effective strategy if you're, as long as you're, guards are able to navigate over the screen which we were not doing very well tonight the hawks were doing a great job of getting the separation and then trey young can basically walk it right in and he was either picking a floater or pulling up for a three so i mean again it, it's not i'm not gonna say it's not an effective defense because it does look really good trey young obviously one of the best in the league at exploiting it but even when it was working we were overall holding the hawks to a pretty pretty fair number like they weren't that's not the way they want to play offense so we were kind of getting them out of their rhythm again the final results, we kept them to a very low amount of points. And the other thing is like, I think there's this perception that Trey Young is like a pseudo Steph Curry type of player. He's a very good player, but his three point shooting in terms of percentage wise really is actually not that good. He can make a few from the parking lot. I think that kind of hike up his numbers. And when he, he's made some big ones, obviously in the past, but percentage wise, historically, he's not a, he's actually not a huge three point shooter. He had it going tonight, obviously he scored 20 points in the first half. He must again, just always cook up from three because I would, <laughs> well, yeah, to me, he, he does seem like that play. If, if, well, I, he does I seem watch like him it, when he plays the Celtics. You will watch more just, outside of Celtics yeah, than me. He but. doesn't put up a high amount of threes or uh, super efficient from there. So, again, obviously, he's a good shooter. And when you're dropping back that far, giving him such wide open looks, then, you know, that's what's going to happen. But, yeah, I think there's something... Because, and I get you, again, Kita is not, the Kita and Cornette are not bigs who are going to switch onto point guards. Like, that's just not going to happen in the NBA, and I think the results will be pretty ugly, and that would be how the Hawks get some alley-oops, uh, some other layups, uh, easier baskets again. So it's kind of like a pick-your-poison there, and clearly the Celtics were content to pick, like, we'll let Young try and beat us. Um, and again, in the first half when we were playing like that, it was fine. We had that 16-point lead. The Hawks were playing very slowly, and we were at least making them work for those possessions in the half court. So they were playing slow. I think what you said, what, they scored 53 points in the half. So, I mean, that's fine. Like, you'll live with that. But at a certain point where they're walking the lead down in the second half is where we have to make a change. I'd like to see some some kind of, you know, and again, it's Kita's. I think this was only like his second time actually playing in the NBA, like any real minutes. So I don't right. want to pick on him, and I'm sure drop coverage is what he knows they're not going to suddenly try to adjust with him on the fly in the middle of the game they waited to get Al back in to do that but there's definitely some middle ground where you can play at the level and Keita can come up a little higher at least get in Young's face so that he's close enough to at least offer like a token contest if Young yeah. is just going to keep pulling up for threes and um, I mean again obviously if if you do that and he starts blowing by you for layups then you adjust from there but um I thought they they were a little too stubborn and stuck in it for longer than i would have liked to see it didn't end up costing us so you know so be it but uh that is you know will be something interesting to monitor and again when we kind of changed our personnel to what it is now we basically committed to this drop coverage and i don't want to say it's not been successful because overall it has we've seen teams like the bucks won a championship playing amazing defense out of the drop coverage uh the bucks actually this year not to go on a side note but their new coach tried to switch them to more of a blitzing switching defense and it was an absolute disaster. They've settled back into their drop covers they've been playing for years, and their team immediately looks way better. So there's, I don't think there's any I mean, like really get, right yeah. or wrong way to do it. It's just so dependent on personnel. Um, and again, there are like little tweaks within it where you can play drop without having such a deep drop coverage where they're basically treating Trey Young like he was Ben Simmons or like Rondo. Um, and that I'd like to see them, <laughs> like I said, coming up at least a little more yeah. to the level. Like you don't have to come and meet him two feet behind the three point line, but you should at least be like ahead of the foul line, maybe at like the college three point line. So I think there are mm -hmm. little adjustments Joe can make without having to like completely compromise our defensive strategy in those situations. Um, but Overall, I think we made it work. And again, at the end of the day, as much as there were some frustrating moments, holding that team to 103 points is, is certainly nothing to scoff at. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, I mean, maybe it's one of those things where when it's not working, it's more noticeable than when it is working. Because for me, it, yeah. I just feel like whenever we're playing poorly, it always it always circles back to the fact 
that we just had this like crazy deep drop coverage. And like you said, there's tweaks to it. I, I mean, like I don't expect a guy like Keita to be able to Keita to be able to like, be super mm-hmm. close to Trey Young, but he should at least be close enough where if you jump, you at least have a hand summon in his face. Right. Thankfully, and, and, think- and you're right, 103 points. I guess I shouldn't be being too upset about the defense, start, but just well, that and- stretch there where they cut the lead. I, but to me, I think it has. I think that league getting cut. More to do with the offense. Yes, exactly. It has more to do with the way that offense was running, uh, that just slow bullshit. And I don't get the logic behind it because I feel like yeah. in the no, past, yeah. you would think it would, you know, it would kind of be like a thing where, okay, well, we don't want to like score too quickly or get a shot too quickly. And if we miss, then it gives them more time to score because I'm not even saying that they need to shoot the ball quicker. They just need to start getting into their get offense, into the offense quicker and yeah. use the whole 22 seconds just spinning the ball around and having the defense spinning around like a fucking top. Uh, that, that's what I don't understand. And so I don't even get the logic behind it at all. When uh, no, it's... They've done less of the just like literally rolling the ball up thing, which, <laughs> which drove me nuts last year. But I'd rather it's... that though, than at least you're not, you're getting across half court with a full shot clock and you're wasting time off the game clock. Like that to me is better than getting the ball and just walking up and I, I taking eight seconds off like, the shot just clock. breeds like the thought though. Well, of just like, yeah, sure, sure. I think that it's like, get up there fast, make it, just keep it moving fast because yeah, no, you're you're letting the defense get set. You're letting all this shit happen. I just, but yeah, Definitely. I do think that was a great. That was a great explanation of drop coverage. I do appreciate that, and I think <laughs> that I'll be. You know, like I said, it's probably one of those things that you notice it more when it's not working than when it is working. But I, I think the problems, I think we agree, both just come from the offense. That that's that when the offense just gets slow and and just like one or two passes or just ISO. Mm-hmm. Well, and, it, it, no, the offense is 100% stuff. the reason this game was closer than it needed to be. And the, I really, again, it's hard to complain much about the defense. I think one more thing about the drop coverage. Exactly like you said, it's more noticeable when, like, it isn't working because the Celtics have been running drop coverage all year. Like, this is just how, how we play now. We don't have any bigs other than, you know, at times with Al, we'll switch everything. But, like, 90% of the time we're playing this drop, and it has been working. And another big part of the drop also is your guards navigating the screen. So Derek White and Drew Holiday, obviously, we didn't have Drew tonight, but those are two guys who are really good at fighting over screens, staying close enough to Young that ideally they can either get back in front of him or contest from behind or by the side. So Mm -hmm. when the screen is that effective, then it looks bad. And again, it looked bad at times tonight when a guy gets it going. But overall, this is the defense we've been playing all year that's been very effective. And even tonight, like you said, there were some, some frustrating open looks, but not only did we keep them to a low number, having them play that way, I think also kind of gets the Hawks out of what they want to do. And it's kind of like the, okay, we'll let young get his, but we're not going to let anyone else beat us. Bogey got hot, obviously made some threes of his own. But other than that, I mean, I think the strategy pretty much worked. They weren't really moving the ball a ton. They weren't getting quick looks like their offense looked stagnant in its own. And other than young's hot shooting, I mean, they, we would have held them to like 85 points. So I think it's a, you know, a little of this, a little of that. Yeah, take the good with the bad, I suppose. But again, yeah, we don't want to get too worked up over a win. It was uh, <laughs> it was a win that we desperately needed to. I mean, it's, it's crazy to say it this early, but after the way that the last game went, uh, again, around just been... around social media, everything, yeah. the sky was falling. Uh, well, we mean... once again have, uh, you know, the contingency of people saying that, you know, we should have just let Ime fuck everybody, including the ushers, like Wise and everything, and we would be better off. I don't really mm-hmm. – I don't understand the obsession with that. Um, Ime, Ime started his first season 18 and 21, and – Every Celtics fan wanted him gone for what it's that, worth, exactly. So. That's 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 my whole thing. It's it's just very bizarre. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tweeted out that I, I feel like he must have been like sleeping with some like Celtics fans too. That the way that some people just like talk about maybe how Joe much is. they missed the guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so sleeping uh, with some Celtics fans' wives. Yeah, I don't know. He doesn't. I don't know. He seems strikes me as the kind of person who just like doesn't have any like. Uh, like needs or wants outside of just like <laughs> basketball. I don't know. He just I hope like, so. he kind of, yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's a different story. We can maybe save that for a, uh, for like a mid season sort of review pod, <laughs> not the game recap, but yeah. Uh, you know, overall, again, aside from that third quarter, there's not a whole lot to complain about. Uh, this team, I think we just have to be accepting of the fact that every game uh, for the most part is just going to feel like a huge sweat. And, I, uh, you know, I think the sooner that we sort of just get used to that and accept that, uh, the more enjoyable the game's going to be. But even with, like, a minute left in the game, they're up 10. And, you know, when they – if they miss they miss the shot, and I just thought, like, oh, my God, like, this it's going to happen. And so, thankfully, it didn't. Um, but, I don't know. Do you have anything else uh, specifically about this game uh, before we get into anything else? 
No, nothing too crazy. Just want to point out again, I think the bench did a good job. Very shorthanded. Banton being thrust into the starting lineup, obviously. Do you think uh, that was just to keep the bench unit sort of intact as it is? I think I that was definitely a big part of it. I think uh, I think they like what he brings in terms of his size, effort, hustle, uh, rebounding, kind of the stuff that I think we needed with the guys we yeah. had out. Um, and he's, you know, a good defender, versatile. But I think more, like you said, keeping the minutes more normalized for the bench. Yeah, because I, I I didn't think he had a very good first half. In the second half, though, he seemed a lot more comfortable out there and a lot a little, a little bit more effective, at least on, a, on the offensive side of things. Yeah, um, I thought he was overall fine. The one other thing I had here... Um, Add another one to the, the Jalen Brown poster highlight reel. He oh, crossed up Trey Jesus and just Christ. absolutely hammered it on uh, on Yekko Okongwo. Uh, awesome poster, Dunk. So those are those are always fun. He's already had a few really good ones this season. Uh, his career highlight reel just gets more and more impressive. But I thought that was that was one of his better ones off that crossover, and he cocked that thing back. Yeah, yeah, that was a very uh, aggressive two points that he scored. But it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean. I, and I think it got the garden going. Like I know that there's people yeah. that think that like dunks are just kind of whatever. It's two points either way. But I think that that gets the garden going, gets the team going. And the underrated thing that I think that that does is with the bench mobs. It gets the guys who aren't playing the games. It builds camaraderie yeah. there. Um, speaking real quick, I guess before we move on to um, everyone was very excited. Jordan Walsh got called up. Obviously didn't play any minutes in this game. Do you, do you think at any point this season, I mean, how, how, down bad do we need to be for Jordan Walsh to get any minutes? Do you think it was just strictly a bodies thing that he got called up? He'll probably yeah. go right back as soon as Drew or Porzingis is back in because he's been 100%. playing well in Maine for everything. I've, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't watch a ton of the Maine Celtics games, but I just see on his stat lines and stuff. He's been playing great there. But do you think we're going to no, see just, him play any meaningful minutes this year? I think we will before the end of the year. No, I think before the end of the year, he'll get a chance at some point. I mean, I think with two guys out, you're going to bring the guys up from Maine, like you said, just to have bodies, especially we're back home. So, I mean, Portland to Boston, that's that's nothing. Quick ride uh, in the Nor'easter. Make that trip in no time, just have them there, like you said, in case of an emergency or in case, you know, we get up 60 points at halftime, want to rest some guys, what have you. But I think for now, the key is to get him as many reps as possible in Maine. And then I think at some point during, you know, the dog days of kind of, you know, the March – February, March, April part of the season is when we maybe see what we've got there, see if he's ready to, to give us something with the team. Um, you know, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't, I hope it's not more of like a break glass in case of an emergency type situation, but I think they don't want to just like thrust him in right now. And especially where we're still trying to build chemistry with the team we have in Boston. So he's probably not going to be part of like our playoff rotation, but it will be cool to, to dust him off and give him a shot at some point. I mean, we've already seen them now do that with Nemes Keita, who we weren't sure, uh, you know, before the preseason, it didn't seem like he might even, I have think a we'll see a lot roster. more. I think, do you think, yeah, I think that he might be taking Cornette's spot as that first I big. Think- I wouldn't say necessarily that. I think it could be something that's dependent on matchup, but I think more it's just good to have another body we can rely on who's a big and it, and like I said, a different kind of big where uh, you know, Cornette is good at what he's good at, but he's not the most fleet footed or athletic type of guy. So it's nice to have someone like Keita who can come in and give you some energy, give you some hustle. And I mean, again, we it, his instant instant impact uh, on the offensive glass, especially, but uh, rebounding in general had a nice block that I think I would think it was a goaltending that block he had on Trey Young, but that was. You don't really see those kind of plays uh, out yeah, of too many of our good. other bigs. So. That was actually a terrible play because I don't think that well, ball was going in. <laughs> like, he just, I don't no, think that but, ball but I mean, an, in. an impressive like display of athleticism blocking yeah, the ball that was almost sure. at the top of the backboard. Like, again, just that kind of rim protection and rebounding is is not necessarily something that we have with the other guys. So I wouldn't say he's going to like take Cornette's minutes, but it's just, again, good to good to have another option. And we saw him playing a lot of two bigs. They had Keita and Al in there at certain points, and I think they – even might have had Keita and Cornette in there for a couple of possessions to together, so. I think that that's got to be it. If yeah, we well, get I think out, it's a clear we message. If, we if you're going to play, you have to rebound. It doesn't matter what position you're playing, and I think we're seeing that with some of these bench guys. And again, I think, like you said, Banton, he didn't play great, but you know that that guy's crashing the glass on both ends when he's in there, and he had yeah. five rebounds in only a few minutes, and I think there was a few other possessions where he went in there and kept it alive, just getting his hands on it, tipping the ball up for someone else to get a chance at it where he doesn't get credit for the rebound, but he, he's making those kind of plays that, again, keep it going, and we've seen firsthand with the Celtics' struggles letting up offensive rebounds, how demoralizing that is, so to create extra yeah. possessions like that, and when you've got Keita and Banton coming in the game and doing that in limited missions, that's huge. Yeah, so tonight... The rebounding we mentioned, 58 to 43, Celtics advantage, yep. 18 to 11 on the offensive glass. We That's had awesome. 24 to 15 um, assist, more assists uh, against them. Uh, mm-hmm. We had 46 to 34 points in the paints and 17 to 8 second chance points. That's all the opposite of what we saw in that last game. So <laughs> Turnovers yeah. down too. 
And yeah, turnovers 12. Uh, they had That's a lot fine. more in the second half. I think they only had like four in the first half. So, but yeah. again, uh, you know, still won the turnover battle. Just basically all the things that they did poorly in the last game, it seemed like they they went out and with a better focus on today. So it was good to see. Cleaned up a lot. Yeah. So again, just running through. So the Celtics win 113 to 103. Tatum has 34 points, nine rebounds, four assists. Jalen Brown, 21 points, seven rebounds, three assists. Derek White, you mentioned, had 15 points, 11 assists. Another really good night for him. Bain got the start, eight points, five rebounds in 18 minutes. Uh, and Cadis, uh seven points, ten rebounds, and only fifteen minutes. It was looking pretty good for him. So don't forget, don't forget Al with his fifteen rebounds. Oh, yeah, I can't forget <laughs> Al. Yeah, Al fifteen. He, yeah, he didn't, he didn't play great offensively, but like you say, he did everything else on the defensive end. Um, he did what we needed him for. He, he's 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 been showing up a lot in some of these moments when they need the guys. So that guy's just timeless. He swatted a ball into the crowd that almost knocked his kid unconscious. Um, <laughs> that was that was. Thankfully, everything turned out okay there. Did but... you hear? Did you hear Scal, who I guess coaches Alston, saying he's going to be the next one? But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I did hear that. I wasn't really sure. <laughs> so Scal coaches. That's interesting. Um, he, that team must lead the league <laughs> in getting two for ones because again, <laughs> it's all they every do. that Scal does not miss a chance to mention a two for one opportunity. It's so funny. Um, <laughs> it's almost like I just I'm waiting for it. Yeah. Um, it's like I, I I can't I think about it before it even comes out of his mouth and then, then it happens. So. <laughs> Yeah, a good win overall for the Celtics. Uh, what do you got for us uh, going on around the league? Around the league, yeah. First, let's just dip into back into the in-season tournament. We obviously had the first game the other night of the in-season tournament. There's a lot of great games after we went off the air uh, and more more just great basketball games early in the season with like pseudo playoff like atmosphere, which is great. We saw the Heat blow a massive lead to the Knicks with uh, Jalen Brunson coming alive, stealing that game for the Knicks to win. We saw the Pistons with an absolutely historic crumble against the Pacers. I think they got outscored like 33 to 14 in that fourth quarter. The Pistons are uh, quietly one of the most depressing teams in the NBA. They're going for, I think it's their 14th straight loss uh, the other tomorrow night or Tuesday night against the Wizards, which should just be a wonderful game. But uh, the, the Pistons, Pistons have been doing this. Yeah, they've been rebuilding for a while and it's it's not looking great. So that I, don't know if that, I don't know if they've won since Mike Wilbon couldn't name a single player besides Cade. <laughs> Well, they got Cade. <laughs> they got Cade. <laughs> uh, the Kings had an impressive win at Minnesota in the in-season tournament, too. And then the Rockets beat down on the Nuggets, holding the Nuggets to 86 points. That Rockets defense, we mentioned Ime earlier. And uh, <laughs> he is doing a hell of a job, though, with that Rockets team. you got to give it to him. So that was fun to see. Uh, again, just can't be more pleased with the in-season tournament stuff. It's going to get even cooler on Tuesday, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, then also some some great stuff happening with this point differential and victory margin in the in-season tournament. You saw perhaps DeMar DeRozan lose his cool uh, when the Raptors were trying to hurry up and score at the end. Siakam was running the ball up, I think tried to shoot a three. DeRozan got in his face, argued, I think got tossed from the game because he was so pissed that they were trying. And then after the game basically said like, I don't care about a point margin. Like you just don't like disrespect a team like that, which is like, no, it's like literally the rules. That's exactly what you have to do. So just hilarious (laughs) for him to say that Uh, the whole thing is made even funnier by the fact that both of those teams had already been eliminated from the (laughs) tournament. (laughs) So all around hilarious situation. Uh, Also some cool stuff in that where uh, the, the, like the teams that moved on were actually shifted by Devin Booker hitting like a long banked in three where the Suns had already secured the win that pushed them to like a plus 34 over the Pelicans who were plus 33. So again, it was like super intense moments in what's yeah. a blowout game because they're trying to push it up in the score. So just funny stuff to see. Um, liking that all around. So again, just just rave reviews about the in-season tournament. And I think you were mentioning earlier that the Celtics kind of might have hurt themselves with not caring more about their winning margin, where now we have super long odds to advance, largely because our victory margin is not better. Uh, someone actually asked Missoula about it. I don't know if you heard it, but he basically said he called off the dogs and brought in all the bench rather than trying to extend our margin because he just valued long-term health with the guys we have banged up and, and keeping the team healthy over chasing points in the tournament, which I mean, but I still, feel like, to, with, I still feel like even with the bench guys, they just weren't trying to score. Well, right. The way so, I don't mind like putting in there. the bench, but I think it, they were just like tripping out the clock. I think it was the game against the Nets, which at the Definitely. time I'll admit too, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about that. So <laughs> right. like, <laughs> I mean, I think either way this like, it's I think cool this last element. week is when everyone, every team finally realized like, Oh, it's point differential. Cause like, I, I feel like the first few weeks, there wasn't any of this at all. Right, and like you said, right. the last two last week, and I think this one on 
uh, no, Tuesday. Yeah, I think guys are looking at the standings and realizing, and they're like, realizing, oh, oh shit, that's it's what they call differential. Them. Holy fuck. Yeah, fun. right. Now the tiebreakers are starting to matter. So, yeah. again, I just think it's another cool wrinkle that's making these games more interesting than we're seeing cool stuff happen, even in blowouts where otherwise it's like a game you turn off and now we're seeing some stuff. So, uh, you know, cool. Another cool wrinkle. I, I like the, the points is, is helping out, I think, and making these in-season tournament games even more exciting and interesting. Yeah. Uh, but that's it really for the in-season tournament. Then we had... Yesterday, we had talked about the uh, kind of cringy situation with Josh Giddy. He was playing yesterday and uh, playing well, started for the Thunder and seemed like business as usual as that investigation goes on. I feel like these situations are kind of always tough because if they're sitting him out, then they're kind of like admitting he did something wrong. Um, so I don't know, but still, so again, he, cringy. I, I and if it does theory. end up being true, it's obviously going to look even worse that he was playing. Well, so I have a theory about that because I just feel like it's one of those things where like social media kind of goes crazy with it and everyone's like, oh, this girl is like 60. But like, I mm -hmm. never saw anyone explaining like how they knew the girl. Like, and again, if he, if she is, then like that's totally fucked and he should be gone. But I just feel like they're investigating it. Should, that investigation should be like, okay, who, who's this girl? Show me your ID. Okay, right. like that's it. Like I don't understand how they investigate. So the fact that he was out there while they investigated <laughs> almost makes me think that social media might have got a little bit of ahead of themselves on it. Again, I'm not. If he is, if, I mean, even if it is just like a, because I, I saw some people being like, oh well, in Oklahoma it's actually 17. <laughs> and it's just like that's not the argument that you're really, that's not you're not really <laughs> making the case you think you're making. That's still pretty yeah, right. I know, creepy. Right? Um, so, I mean, if it is just something like, you know, the fact that he was out there while they investigate, I'm just sort of like, I just don't care what the investigation could be. If it's not just like, how old is this girl? This yeah, it should was, be, this pretty, old? It should be okay. pretty, pretty open and shut case. Um, unless investigating means just like identifying the girl. I don't, I don't like, I don't know what, what yeah, it who, could be I mean, that. The fact that he was out there makes me think that there might've been a little bit of social media getting a little ahead of his skis, but again, we'll see. I mean, he could. You know, I think there is a bit of a double standard. The fact that, you know, he's out there during the investigation and other players haven't been, but it was, uh, it was, it was weird. And it was weird that he got a standing ovation. He got like a big loud cheer. Again, if they're going to play him, sure. But if you're a fan of Oklahoma City, you don't really have to go that all out. Uh, yeah. On that the seems support. Unnecessary. Especially if it's not like he missed any games. Like, it's just, yeah, it's just right. another game for him. Yeah. But, so. I mean, that was a good game of itself. An absolute high scoring battle between the Thunder and the uh, 76ers. Sixers pulled it out. And I think uh, Embiid kind of dominated. I think he had 19 free throws. And just as a side note, on the Thunder. Well, no, but. <laughs> I think that's one the one thing to watch with the Thunder is do they have the size and the true kind of big men down low, whereas Chet's really good and really skilled, but those are the kind of matchups that are going to be tough, so it's just interesting to watch and that they mm -hmm. weren't able to pull that out, but really good game, two good teams. That was fun. Um, the Clippers, also, we've talked a lot of shit about them, but give them some props now. They've won four out of five, had a huge win last night over the Mavericks. They look like they're figuring some things out. Shout out our boy Danny Tice, too. He's playing great basketball for them. He's picking and popping, hitting threes. He's scoring. He's blocking shots. He's rebounding, doing it all. He looks like he has, like, a second lease on life just to be out of Indiana, stuck at the end of their bench. Like, he's playing really mean minutes now, and he's absolutely taking advantage. He looked great. Hollywood so. Tice. Hollywood Danny Tice. Good for him. <laughs> I'm happy to I see did, like I said. I, I did know see, we don't love that team, but I'm, I'm not, always going to root for Tice. So. I did see in that game, too, that at one point, like, Russell Westbrook went at Luka and scored and just was, like, basically just, like, screaming, like, on the court, like, go at him! Go, like, just yeah. basically telling his whole team to just it's good go advice, at Luka. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> it's just, that's just funny to see. I mean, the thing is, so Westbrook, and I, if you don't mind me just quickly saying something about it, like I saw, do. he's kind of a guy that's been like clowned on a lot in social media. And I think now that he's taking on this bench role too, people are kind of clowning on his minutes. But to me, I don't know. I just think I, I, I used to really like, I used to love Westbrook when they were on the, th uh, the Thunder and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I think especially with the, when KD left, the way he was like such an asshole to him, I loved it. Um, I don't know. I just think it's kind of lame to be like shitting on the guy's stat line when he decides to take a bench role. And it's just like, totally agree. I mean, players just aren't, he's, you know, he's, he was a great player at one point. He's still a pretty solid player now, but it's, it's like, yeah, I mean, his days of being a superstar are probably over, but I think that having like a second act in your career where you're sort of just moved back to playing this like second fiddle or, or in his case, like fourth or fifth fiddle. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's any like shame in that. I think that it'd be even it'd all. be more lame if he like refused to accept that. So a hundred percent. No, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I, I think yeah. that's so that's ridiculous. Just a quick to, thing. We don't need to get deep into them, but no, but it, it is one of those things where you always see it's, especially for guys who were superstars like that to age gracefully and to accept more of a backseat, to actually be able to help your team win. 
a lot of stars are unable to do that. And for a while, Westbrook wasn't able to do that. And it seemed like his career might be over. So I give him a ton of credit. He's focused on the things he does well. He still is able to provide a ton of energy for that bench unit. He's become like a very, very good role player, which it really didn't seem like he would ever be able to do. And what his new teammate, James Harden, is absolutely not able to do and probably will never be able to do. So clowning on, you know, there were times when clowning on Westbrook was appropriate, but for this, it's just stupid. Like, what do you want the guy to do? Keep being a 40% usage guy on a team that is in the lottery or retired. Like those are really the only other alternatives other than accepting his role and trying to help the team win that a team that has, you know, aspirations to go places. So I I think this is the last thing that Westbrook should be clowned on. I give him a lot of credit for being able to do this uh, for how much pride he obviously has. Yes. What do you want the fuckers out there on social media? Yeah, Back no, off. this this is not not the time to be getting on him for that at all. Um, all right, what else you got? Elsewhere, we've got a quick Kelly Oubre update. Nothing more on the whole situation, but he did return to practice today. So uh, obviously way ahead of whatever this projected timetable was when the original whatever happened happened. Uh, just, you know, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever get any more answers. I still... Did he just fall off his bike or something? It's definitely looking more and more like that. I, I don't know what happened, but it seems like the story may just go away and he might just be back on the court playing and we may never really know more than that. So uh, I don't know, maybe he's, yeah, I suppose so, uh, but we'll see. And then uh, another thing, we haven't mentioned it in a while, but your boy Devin Booker, since uh, coming back from his injury, <laughs> he has not missed the game. He's not load managing the other two Load have done some load managing. No, no KD, no Beal tonight. Booker playing the only of the big three coming into Madison Square Garden played great. Twenty eight points, uh, eleven assists. Had an outrageous, uh, almost buzzer beater. Hit a dagger, fadeaway three to uh, break the tie with one point seven seconds left. Awesome shot. The Suns are now eight and one when Booker plays this season, and I think they're like four and six without him. So uh, just a hell of a player. Not really much more. We'll keep monitoring that, but he. He continues to be super right. impressive. To so, me. what was that? You said eight and one when he plays, mm-hmm. six and four when he doesn't. No, no, no. Or no, Worse four and that. six when he doesn't. Losing record without him. I, I forget the exact amount. All um, right, but well, well, my point is him. that's ten games without him, nine games with him. I'm still in the win. What's their record? Part. I don't know. Uh, I got it no, right here. That's, that's too I actually haven't pulled. They up. haven't played that many games. Oh yeah, they're eleven and six, so they're eight and one with him. Yeah. Okay. So Shit. Three well, and, three and five without him. Okay. Right. But again, my whole point all along was that he's not a load manager. He likes to play. He had a legitimate injury. Now that the injury's over, he's playing every game, and he's been easily the best player on the team with Kevin Durant and one of the best players in the league. I expect that to continue. I don't expect him to keep missing times, obviously, unless he gets a serious injury. But I think this is – I just think this has been a misguided narrative since the beginning is my point. I don't think he's a load manager. I will manager continue guy. to push this misguided narrative. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. That's it for um, around the league, but I do want to mention within the league, we obviously got the Chris Apps Porzingis news. Uh, Chris Apps posting on Instagram that he got good news uh, the, yesterday, which I guess, I mean, it's not bad news, but then we hit, said they'll reevaluate him in a week, which, I mean, hopefully that's it, and he'll be back mm-hmm. in a week, but I'm a little more concerned maybe than the, the Celtics are acting like I should be. I This is kind of how things start, and then before you know it, it's like, a month has gone by and they're like, yeah, we'll read, we'll check them out again in a week. So again, hopefully it's nothing. And if he says it's good news, like I, I doubt he would put that on social media if he doesn't think it actually is. Um, I mean, he but might again, think this, it this is, is the yeah, concern. Calf, with yeah. this. Calfs is just like, that's something that where you just wake up and it's just still bothering yeah. you. So it's not I mean, great. And I mean, again, it's good to win games without him and the really, all that all that matters is having him 100% when the playoffs start. So mm-hmm. if that does mean shutting him down for a month, even if he probably could back, be back in a week, then like I'm 100% down to err on the side of caution. But again, we mentioned it all off season, and as the start of this season, like the biggest thing with Porzingis in his career has been health and durability. So starting to crop up a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to overreact right now, but something we are absolutely keeping a very, very close eye on. Yeah, I do think that there's sort of like a little bit of like a misunderstanding with people when they say like, we'll reevaluate it in a week. People think like, oh, so we'll be back in a week. That means No, that means we'll reevaluate it in a week. So right. that could easily become uh, a week by week kind of basis thing, which could easily yeah. that leads to like being a longer. I hope it's right. not. Started with day to day. It's already week to week. Like, Yeah, it would be strange for him to like say good news. But then again, who knows? I mean, yeah. like he might have been, news, he might have like, been you're expecting. You're not out for the season? That's good well, news. Good, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's exactly it. He might have been looking at it as like, uh, you know, I didn't like tear my calf or something like that. So that's considered good right. news. But. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess, <laughs> yeah, guess reevaluating so, in a week isn't the worst news you could possibly receive, but I'm not sure I would say good news. 
<laughs> yeah. But again, like you said, as long as he's healthy, I'm 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 a little bit uh, concerned. I think I guess Drew was possible to go today. They in shoot around, it yeah. still felt the ankle. I saw him warming up, and he looked fine. So I mean, with Drew, it's it's just an ankle. I, I'm not really too concerned about that. I'm sure is when he's ready, he'll be out there. Not not super concerned there. The Porzingis injury, obviously, a much 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 more massive concern for the mm-hmm. Celtics. Just means a little bit more Akita time. <laughs> more Akita, some more Cornet. Oh my God. I'm sure we'll get some banton. Who yeah. knows what we'll see. Um, all right, cool. So yeah, that's around the league. A little bit of extra on the Porzingis news there. Uh, mm-hmm. We have our next game is on Tuesday against the Chicago Bulls. Final game of the yep. in-season tournament. Practically impossible for us. I think we'd have to beat the Bulls by a large, large margin. We have to win by at least 23 to have any chance. And that, and would, be, we... and that would be only if like the Raptors We lost. need some help. Yeah. We then need with no. I tweeted yeah, it out I think from we the, the Nets corner to beat, thing. <laughs> we'd need the Nets to beat the Raptors, but they have but an not eight by point a better amount. margin. Yeah. We'd need to win by at least eight more than them, but they still yeah. would need to win. So crazier things have it's happened, looking, but so and and we're kind of in a bad spot too for the wild card too, right? Like it doesn't even look like yeah. We're and make with the wild card, round. kind of the same. We'd need a bunch of uh, points, and we'd need about four or five other teams to lose and. Uh, have their margin go. All down. right, we could have a so special. Say, we could have a special edition Chuddy's Corner, uh, dugouts parlay, the Chuddy Bar parlay. If people are just calling it the Chuddy Bar parlay, which I don't know how you feel about that because it makes it sound like it's your it. parlay and it hasn't hit once. So I'm okay with people <laughs> calling it the Chuddy Bar oh, parlay. I see, I see. But, um, True. We might have to do a special edition. Uh, I tried the reverse fade today. Maybe we just bet all those teams that we need to lose to win. Okay. And maybe we, we hit them with the reverse mush. Um, we actually came close on the Chuddy Bar uh, today. I think the only guy that ruined it was Banton, which was not on anyone. I didn't know Banton was it. What was the Banton problem? I had okay. Banton under six and a half points, and he had eight points. And then oh, I had wow. Jalen under 23 and a half, and I had Horford under nine and a half. So Jalen and Horford both finished under, but it was fucking Banton. Solano. Yeah, and it, was, and it was like uh, I think the the one he scored on was um, that play where we like kind of tapped it ahead and I, yeah, I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Jalen like, like uh, didn't miss man, mishandled Tatum it, but lost it, it and Hauser it took found it its way to Hauser. Like, yeah, <laughs> so that was yeah. the way he got the points uh, too. So uh, he was sitting at six for a while. I couldn't believe it that the Chuddy Bar actually hit, but um, what can you yeah, do? Banton, Banton ruined it for us. So, um, but yeah, Definitely. we meant to pull it some reverse mush. <laughs> the one thing I will say is if we don't advance in the in-season tournament would be a little disappointing but that would mean a obviously we are not at risk of playing the two extra games we should also get a much easier opponent because we will play that game against a non-quarterfinal team and it also means i think we'll only have i think we'll have like no road games for almost an entire calendar month so in terms of schedule because uh, we travel, still play regular season games during those right it's just like the, yes. they don't have those games picked out yet yes so it would be beneficial for our strength of schedule and our travel um, and being able to rest, which obviously in the grand scheme of things is the most important thing as we're already seeing the team is banged up. So I'll happily uh, spin it into a positive if we don't yeah. advance on Tuesday night. Um, but just like, and I would say, I mean, the Bulls, I mean, the Bulls suck, right? I mean, we don't need to. They're just... not good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's, your, there's bad. your preview. Yeah. The Bulls suck. If we lose to them, that's really, really bad. Um, it would be bad. It would definitely be bad. But um but I mean they have good professional players. You can't take anyone in the NBA lightly. DeRozan obviously pissed right. off after If you're in the Celtics the locker room, don't him. listen to this. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh definitely, definitely a game the Celtics should win. Okay. All right, cool. So we'll see everyone back here Tuesday night for the recap of the Celtics Bulls game. Um, possibly with uh in season tournament berth. Most likely with just a little bit of clarity on who we might be playing in those other regular season games and an extended home home stretch. Uh, hopefully mm-hmm. by then we'll maybe see Drew Holiday back. Uh, hopefully maybe we'll have a little bit more news on Porzingis. But for now, we can rest easy knowing that the Celtics uh, took care of business tonight. 113-103 mm-hmm. win over the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, Chuddy, a pleasure as always. Everyone out there in the uh, Chuddyverse, have a good rest of your night. Take care. We'll see you Tuesday. Peace out, Chuddy Heads.